Welcome everyone. Today in our series of um, FRCS uh, part 2 viva preparations, we are discussing prostate cancer. We have uh, trainees who are going for the exam and uh, kindly given us the consent to record the session so that it will be a good revision tool. We are discussing prostate cancer, diagnosis, investigations, active surveillance, if time permits, intermediate and metastatic prostate cancer. Okay, you have a 68 year old gentleman referred by GP for a PSA of 5.9. How will you proceed? Uh, first, I like to see this patient in my uh, oncology clinic in the presence of uh, a nurse specialist. I like to get a detailed history and a progress examination. Uh, to start with, I like to know why the PSA was done and uh, whether the <coughs> this PSA was the first PSA done or it was done in a series of follow-up. And then I like to ask whether uh, he had any uh, a lower urinary tract symptoms, whether storage or voiding symptoms. If so, the duration of the symptoms, the bothersome of the symptoms, or whether any uh, treatment was undertaken for those, and uh, whether there any history of uh, hematuria, rectal like urinary tract infection, or incontinence, and uh, whether the, there was any past history of any neurological uh, conditions for which any uh, intervention in the form of pericarditization or instrumentation was carried out, any history of malignancy with a uh, history of uh, treatment in the form of surgery, uh, radiotherapy, or chemotherapy, any uh, history of uh, prostate cancer or breast cancer in the family and uh, a person history in the form of whether it's a diabetic or there's any history of uh, substance abuse or drug abuse and uh, about this, uh, any uh, complaints regarding his uh, sexual history at, uh, in the means of erectile dysfunction or sexual dysfunction. And uh, I'd like to uh, go in for an uh, examination. examination. I'd like to uh, assess his uh, general, uh, general condition as uh, BMI and uh, his abdomen. Uh, to look for any uh, palpable uh, swellings or masses, abdomen, look for any palpable bladder, sex and genitalia, uh, penis, meatus, and the urethra, and the scrotum, and the testis. And I like to do a parietal examination with consent and a simple question to look for the prostate, the size of the prostate, the consistency of the prostate, the presence of any uh, abnormal nodules in the prostate. And uh, with this, I like to uh, go in for uh, further investigations. Good. Uh, good comprehensive preparation and um, as I said, uh, I don't think you can reduce this anywhere, but uh, just look at the examiner. If examiners are happy, try to stop and see because this will give the examiner a confidence that yes, this guy is studied well and he's practiced well, etc. But it won't give you any extra marks. The opening gambit is to get an approval from the examiner that I am a good guy. I am interested in talking high science. I'm interested in talking into the depth of discussion. I'm not here just to pass and get the margin mark or something like that. That's what you need to prove. Only one suggestion is you are quite good in bringing the history specific to prostate. You can also add one sentence on I will ask for or look for the presence of signs of uh, weight loss, back pain or anorexia. That will be the signs for the advanced prostate cancer. So that, uh, I mean, of course, with the PSA of 5.9, we are not expecting it. But this will complete that, okay, he is having the prostate cancer in his mind. He is looking for the specific low, intermediate and high grade cancers possibilities in that particular patient. You mentioned about uh, the breast cancer. What is the importance in asking the breast cancer history in this man? Uh, the probability that the patient might have a hereditary carcinoma of the prostate, which is linked to a BRCA2, uh, which is uh, linked both to prostate cancer as well as breast cancer. Okay. Uh, how far the BRCA2 will increase the chances of risk of cancer? Uh, hereditary risk of cancer, it's... Uh, Say, for example, if this patient's uh, father had a risk of, uh, a father okay, had prostate uh, cancer, how much high yeah, risk okay, he so has? <coughs> if there's a one first relative who is a father, then the relative risk increased by 2.5 times. If it's a brother, it uh, aggravates by, it's increased by 5 times. And if it's two relatives, it's increased by, uh, uh, two, I mean, uh, it's a brother, it's increased by 3.5 times. Two relatives, it's 5 times. And if it's three first relatives, then it increased by 10 to 11 times. Yeah, almost that. Uh, three relatives means 11 times. Um, tell me about the PSA, uh, what is the half-life of PSA, uh, you are doing a DRE, say for example, if you want to repeat a PSA, how far the DRE will affect the PSA results? Uh, so, uh, PSA is a serine protease secreted by the process, yes. it's a not specific, uh, to the, it's only, it's only organ specific, it's not uh, specific to any disease condition. 
it is a half life of around uh, 2 to 3 days and uh, a simple dre uh, usually alters the psa by uh, around uh, 0.25 to 0.26 nanogram per deciliter and uh, if the dre is combined with a vigorous prosthetic massage for a uh, urine sample or anything then uh, that might uh, cause a significant alteration in the psa otherwise a simple dre is not going to cause a great or a significant variation in the psa Okay, how will you decide the patient has normal PSA? What reference you use? Uh, it's a uh, criteria of, uh, which was uh, laid down by the Osterling study, which is uh, which gives an age-related PSA in the patient. So it is uh, graded from uh, 40 to 50 years with a PSA of uh, 2.5. 50 to 60, the normal PSA is less than 3.5. 50 uh, 60 to 70, the PSA is less than 4.5, and uh, above 70, the PSA should be less than 6.5. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on screening for prostate cancer? Uh, screening for uh, prostate cancer, there has been uh, various studies in uh, different parts of the world uh, which has both been in favor as well as in against. For example, the CAP trial in the UK had showed uh, no big uh, difference or no big uh, gain in the screening of the prostate. Uh, so did the PLCO trial from the US. But the ESRPC trial uh, had shown a uh, significant advantage in uh, screening of the prostate from uh, uh, close to 18% uh, gain in uh, identifying the CA prostate. And uh, the PCPT trial has also shown a, a significant increase in the identification of the prostate with screening. But uh, basically, CA prostate is, does not satisfy all the Wilson and Unger criteria for uh, ideal disease for uh, screening of the prostate. So according to uh, NICE guidelines, there is uh, no general or a population screening for the prostate cancer. It's only confined to an opportunistic screening. Uh, what is the UK trial you mentioned? Uh, a CAP trial, CAP. Okay, can you explain that? Uh, sorry, I'm not able to recall the details also. Okay, since it's a UK based trial, the examiners may be interested okay. to know that. It's a randomized controlled trial and uh, cancer in the screened population is 4.3 while in non-screened population is 3.6. So we can find more cancers in screened population. It's quite a no-brainer answer. Uh, do you know about PROTECT T PROTECT study outcome? What is PROTECT study? Um, Again, it's important to know sorry. the PROTECT study because it's a UK based study. And uh, it, it uh, compared between the active monitoring of a patient's PSA and not labeling it as active surveillance. So any UK based studies like PROTECT study, prostate cancer risk management program in UK, CAP trial as yeah. you mentioned, PCPT trial, those things just know a little bit here and there. Do you know what is sure. PCPT trial? Uh, PCPT is a prostate cancer prevention trial which is also uh, where the risk decrease in associated with the finasteride was studied. So it showed a decrease of around 24.8% uh, decrease in the uh, CA prostate incidence. But there was also a rise in the high-risk cancer or prostate which was identified during the study. Yeah, so high-risk cancers in finasteride arm is 6.4 compared to placebo arm of 5.1. Good, you are good in the values. Um, take me through the Wilson and Junger screening criteria. How that influences the prostate cancer screening? Uh, Wilson and Jenga criteria lays down uh, 10 uh, conditions to uh, label a disease as uh, ideal for screening. So uh, the disease should be a significant public health problem. It should have a, a latent phase uh, to proceed from the diagnosis to a significant uh, clinical stage. And uh, there should be a easily available diagnostic tool. The diagnostic tool should be acceptable to all the population. It should be cost effective. The entire pathophysiology of the disease should be well known. And there should be a uh, proper and uh, documented uh, methods of treatment for all stages of the disease. Okay. At one point, you can say there are totally 10 factors which uh, Wilson and Junger found in the criteria, but I don't think you need to go through all the 10 factors. It's a bit of a non-urological non in nature. Okay. In which group of patients you will advise PSA testing, early PSA testing? So, uh, early PSA in uh, men above the age of 45. Uh, who had a family history of uh, carcinoma of the prostate, or in uh, men above 45 who is far from the African descent, and men above 40 who are uh, known to have a positive PSA 2 gene. Okay, so this patient has increased PSA. Examination showed normal prostate. What is your next steps? Uh, so next, I'll uh, let to proceed to investigation. To start with, uh, I'll get a basic uh, urine dipstick. 
so uh, serum urea and uh, electrolytes and uh, i like to get a uh, multiparametric mri in this patient okay uh, the mri showed pyra 3 focus in the left peripheral zone and pyra 4 a small focus in the right peripheral zone what is the importance of this pyrat scores uh, pyrat stands for uh, prostate uh, <coughs> image recording and uh, data system so uh, it is a method of uh, uh, reporting and uh, analyzing the findings of uh, multiparametric mri and it's graded into uh, grade 1 to 5 with a, a positive predictive value of uh, grade 3 4 and 5 being 15 40 and 70 percentage for uh, carcinoma of the prostate Okay, so what is your next step now? Uh, since the pirate score uh, is uh, 3 and 4, so there is a high, uh, it's highly likely of a uh, chasm of the prostate in the patient. So the next step should be to obtain a diagnostic biopsy. I like to discuss with the patient about the MRI findings and uh, PSA being out above the range for his age. And uh, I like to point out to him that the uh, need for a biopsy is. Uh, uh, is there in this patient? So, the, I like to explain to him about the perineal biopsy, the local uh, anesthesia transperineal biopsy technique, the procedure of the technique, the risk and the complications associated, and the probability of the finding uh, being positive for malignancy, and if so, the treatment needed. Okay. Um, it's very important that in BPH and prostate cancer table, you need to bring as much of evidences as possible. Uh, it's better if you bring, if not, the examiner can also ask. Usually in other tables, they won't ask any named studies or evidences. But as much evidence you bring, if you can, that will give you better marks. What is the evidence to support MRI in the prostate cancer diagnostic pathway? Uh, MRI is supported by uh, two named studies. One is the PROMIS trial and the other is the PRESSION trial. According to the PROMIS trial, MRI uh, is a fund of, uh, for evaluation of CA prostate as a high in sensitivity of around 92 percentage a good negative predictive value of 18 percentage and uh, with the mri guided trust biopsy more than uh, up to 28 percentage of uh, negative biopsies have been avoided so uh, this is a promised trial and the present trial compares a uh, mri guided trust biopsy and a uh, plain trust biopsy and the uh, direct positive yield in mri guided biopsy was close to uh, 36 percentage when compared to 20 percentage in a non-mri trust okay that's good uh, how will you calculate PSA density in a patient? Uh, PSA density is calculated by uh, PSA divided by the volume of the prostate. The volume of the prostate is calculated by the ellipsoid formula, which is the length into breadth into uh, height multiplied by 0.52. And the normal value of the PSA density being 0.15 nanogram per ml per ml. Okay. Your patient had uh, biopsies, both targeted biopsies and systemic left and right transperineal local anesthesia biopsy. The biopsy came as two cores on the left side and one core on the right side showing high grade pin and ASAP respectively. The other cores were benign. What will you do now? Uh, so the biopsy showed uh, two cores of HGPIN and uh, one core of ASAP. Right? Yeah. That's okay. Uh, so, according to the NICE guideline, uh, HGPN uh, has a probability of uh, giving a 20 to 30 percent positivity in a further biopsy. But uh, the criteria laid down is there should be at least three or more positive cores for a HGPN for a repeat biopsy to be immediately done. Uh, but the timeline uh, is not specifically mentioned for a repeat biopsy. And similarly, in the ASAP or uh, asana small cell uh, proliferation, atypical small cell asana proliferation, the probability of finding a positive uh, malignancy in a further biopsy is close to 40 percentage. And even in this case, the timeline, exact timeline for the follow-up biopsy is not mentioned. Okay. Um, let us assume that you are following this patient with PSA. The PSA further increases and then you may be repeating your MRI and you are repeating your posture biopsy. And uh, it uh, came as three cores of Gleason 3 plus 3 prostate cancer occupying the left side. All other cores were negative. How will you differentiate or risk stratify people with prostate cancer? What is your next step? Okay. Uh, so the NICE uh, risk stratification is uh, based on Gleason score, the PSA and the clinical staging. So the uh, it's classified into uh, low risk, intermediate risk and high risk. The uh, low uh, intermediate risk is uh, PSA value uh, of uh, 10 to 20, a Gleason of 7, and a TNF staging of uh, T2B. 
anything less than that is supposed to be a low risk uh, and anything above that is a high risk application okay so what will you do for your patient so uh, here's a gleason 3 plus 3 which falls into the uh, low risk and a pca less than 10 which is uh, also in the low risk criteria so uh, it'll be stratified as a low risk for a carcinoma of the prostate okay so what will you do uh, so uh, it's a 68 year old male with a low risk carcinoma of the prostate and uh, so he can be advised uh, active surveillance or uh, watchful waiting. And so the details of both active surveillance and watchful waiting would be explained to him. And uh, I would uh, advise active surveillance for him, citing him the pros and cons of the same and the follow-up needed for the same. So what is the difference between active surveillance and watchful waiting? Active surveillance is uh, it's a, uh, continuous monitoring of the patient who is a low-risk patient with a, a predefined setup of investigations and follow-up and shift on to a radical treatment when there is a, a, ch when there is a change in the uh, clinic biochemical values or a clinical progress of the disease. But as watchful waiting is a willful deferment of the treatment until it's necessary. So, uh, there is no defined criteria for a watchful waiting and uh, the patient may not be fit for a radical treatment. Whereas in uh, active surveillance, uh, the patient has a lifetime expectancy of uh, greater than 15 years. He's fit for a radical surgery. He's uh, made to uh, go through a strict, uh, strict or stringent uh, predefined follow-up criteria. And if there's any deviation of the biochemical or the clinical values, then he's made to, uh, then he's shifted on to a radical treatment. So which group of patients you will opt for watchful waiting? Uh, watchful waiting a uh, patient who has a life expectancy of uh, less than uh, 10 years and uh, who may not be fit for a uh, radical surgery or a radical radiotherapy. Okay, so and, uh, patient obviously of... your patient, you don't have to bring watchful waiting in the discussion, okay? Okay, okay. He's quite young and fit. Um, what do you know about the ISUP grading, Gleason score grading? ISUP grading is uh, based on the Gleason score. Uh, it's graded as 1, 2, 5, Gleason's 1 being uh, 3 plus 3, uh, I mean, ISP 1 is Gleason 3 plus 3, 2 is 3 plus 4, uh, ISP 3 is uh, Gleason 4 plus 3, ISP 4 is uh, Gleason 8, and ISP 5 is Gleason 9 and 10. Okay. So, your patient, you are discussing active surveillance. How are you going to explain this to the patient? I'll uh, explain uh, to the patient that... Uh, we're putting on active surveillance, which is a, a predefined uh, set of uh, <coughs> investigations and follow-up needed. So the patient will be uh, will have to undergo a PSA test for every four months, a DRE uh, uh, at the end of the first year, and a, a multi-parametric MRI uh, for around 12 to 18 months. If there is any significant changes in the multi-parametric MRI from the previous MRI, then he might have to undergo a repeat biopsy. And based on the biopsy, if the biopsy is... Uh, uh, as an upgrade of the disease, then uh, we might go through a radical treatment. If it is not, he enters the second year of active surveillance where uh, PSA is done every six months and a DRE at the 12 months. At the end of second year, there is no significant change and the patient can be discharged to the GP and is put on a PSA follow-up. Okay. So you are following up this patient. Um, his PSA was stable and uh, you are following it maybe for two years. After that, the PSA is slowly showing some increasing trend. It goes up to 8 and your follow-up reaches up to 10. Your every repeat MRI shows pyrad 4 lesions, which is much larger compared to the previous one. You are repeating the prostate biopsy. It shows Gleason 4 plus 3 occupying at least half of the course. Your total course are 18. What will you do now? So uh, PSA is 10, his uh, Gleason's is 7, and uh, his uh, positive score is more than 50. So uh, any positive score, so is there is observation of the disease from his previous state, the positive score greater than 50, so he has to be shifted from active surveillance into a radical form of treatment. I'd like to explain to him about the options for radical treatment. It can be either a radical prostatectomy or a radical radiotherapy, about the pros and cons, the complications of the same, and uh, and I'd like to discuss with him and uh, let him opt for the model of treatment he prefers. Okay, what treatment methods you will offer him? I'll offer him uh, surgery or radiotherapy. So it is radical prostatectomy and uh, the radiotherapy can be uh, either external beam radiotherapy or uh, brachytherapy. Okay, at point uh, one point you should uh, introduce the Bose information leaflets because there is a leaflet yeah, for yeah. active surveillance also. Okay, yeah. so how will you explain the option of surgery for him? 
Sorry, I didn't hear you. How will you explain the radical surgery for him? Uh, I'll discuss the patient uh, about the options. So, radical uh, surgery is radical prostatectomy. So, I'll uh, tell him the surgery involves a uh, removal of uh, the prostate gland along with the seminal vesicles and the <coughs> ejaculatory ducts and the urethra of the uh, prostatic urethra with anastomosis of the bladder to the remaining part of the urethra. And uh, the complications are uh, the risk could be, uh, since it's a major surgery, it's associated with its, uh, the anesthetic risk, the uh, peroperative uh, or intraoperative risk, and the postoperative risk. There is a high probability of uh, erectile dysfunction, incontinence. And <coughs> I'll also explain to him about the probability of a uh, margin being positive after the surgery and the treatment which might be required for the same. Again, you need to bring in the... Bring in the bowel leaflet. Bowel leaflet, okay. Uh, yeah, later discuss the bowel leaflet. Yeah, don't forget that. Do you know any studies which support radical prostatectomy? I think it's... Uh, e SPCG is a four study. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a pivot study. Okay. Anything about that you are aware of? Any data? Uh, SPC post study had a cancer specific survival of close to 89 percentage. It compared, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure, I'm not able to recall. Yeah, so radical prostatectomy provides superior cancer specific survival, overall survival, and progression free survival when compared to watchful waiting. They had a median follow up of 23.6 years. And uh, anything about pivot study? A uh, pivot study was a comparison between a uh, radical prostatectomy and uh, observation. And initially, the study showed no, no uh, major difference between both the groups, but uh, a subgroup analysis showed that uh, radical prostatectomy was uh, more favorable in the intermediate risk group at a specific survival of close to 90 percentage. Okay, so this is one of the study which has strongly supported as the view of active surveillance. So the surgery is more useful only in intermediate risk. And why it is not in the high risk group is high risk group, maybe they have already metastasized. So that's why anybody with known metastasis, we are not discussing radical surgery. Anybody with a low risk group, we are discussing active surveillance. So the pivot study has a big bearing in our clinical practice now. Okay. okay. So what about the role of robotics in the radical prostatectomy? Uh Robotic prostatectomy when compared to uh, open or laparoscopic prostatectomy has uh, certain advantages in the form of uh, uh, less blood loss, shorter operative, uh, less blood loss, shorter hospital stay, shorter recovery time and uh, early recovery. And the uh, disadvantages being uh, prolonged uh, surgical time and uh, cost is not cost effective in compared to open surgery. Yeah. Otherwise, the oncological outcome or the trifecta outcome in the form of oncological clearance, the incontinence and erectile dysfunction or the sexual function is almost the same for uh, both robotic prostatectomy as well as open prostatectomy. There is no major difference between. Okay. What is the role of neoadjuvant uh, treatment? Uh, anything available prior to radical prostatectomy? Uh, there has been no specific role for uh, neoadjuvant treatment before radical prostatectomy, either formal treatment or radiotherapy. Okay, so you can uh, bring in a uh, Cochrane review which showed there is no evidence of any uh, neoadjuvant uh, treatment or especially antigen deprivation treatment before radical prostatectomy. The main reason why, why we are discussing it, we do for radical uh, radiotherapy. Radiotherapy, okay. that's, yeah. That's why you need to know the Cochrane review. Okay, uh, so this patient undergoing radical prostatectomy, robotic assisted. What is your view on lymph node dissection? Uh, lymph node dissection in uh, CA prostate is usually advised for an uh, in intermediate or a uh, high risk group. And uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is based on certain uh, no nomograms such as uh, the Parton's nomogram or the Roche thromba, where the instance of the uh, instance is greater than 5% in uh, uh, lymph node dissection is proceeded. But if there has been uh, any evidence of an MRI guided by a previous MRI attempt, then the uh, instance can be uh, if the instance of suppose instance is greater than seven percentage, then we can go in for a lymph node dissection. Okay, so it's mainly for the patients with high risk disease, but it is not shown to improve the oncological outcome. Again, because it's of only the same for staging and prognosis. Yeah. yeah. So, 
the, the why it's not improving the oncology outcome is again the disease is out of our hands once the patient has lymph node metastasis then there may be a microscopic lymph node metastasis anywhere from head to toe so overall yeah. oncological outcome won't be good but the, the same patient if he's not undergoing lymph node clearance or radical prostatectomy he may have some local symptomatic problems like the cancer growing locally causing bladder outlet obstruction uh, may spread to urethra causing pain may spread to the pelvic nerves or may even perforate the rectum so those kind of local complications you may improve but overall cancer related uh, benefit depends upon the overall cancer head to toe which we are not going to change by lymph node resection okay the same thing almost applies to renal cancers also so whenever you are reading just keep the other cancers in your uh, field of vision to compare so that you get a wholesome idea on the oncology good you are discussing the radical surgery and radiotherapy for this patient and uh, let us assume the patient opted for radiotherapy so what type of radiotherapy is available for him and how will you discuss that uh since it's a uh, intermediate risk uh, both the uh, brachytherapy and uh, external radiotherapy can be given to brachytherapy you know external radiotherapy is a <coughs> you know radiation which is uh, given in the form of a uh, 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 conventional dose uh, being a uh, 75 gray in uh, 37 settings but uh, but currently the hypofractional dose is being followed which involves around uh, 60 gray given in uh, 20 doses so uh, which means a less number of doses uh, less number of uh, side effect profile and uh, now the radiation given is more in the form of uh, intensity moderated radiation which is also conformal so uh, it is confined to the uh, anatomical uh, zones of the prostate with the uh, a uh, variation in the intensity depending upon the zones of the prostate so all this uh, leads to a increase in uh, radiation dose which is specific to the diseased area so the decrease exposure of the surrounding or the peripheral normal areas to radiation what are the contraindications for external beam radiotherapy uh, the any patient having a severe lutes uh, patient with a previous history of uh, radiation and uh, inflammatory bowel disease Thanks, Dr. Babu. So, you can bring in chip trial when you are discussing the yeah. intensity modulated radiotherapy. What is the role of uh, androgen deprivation treatment in a patient planned for radical radiotherapy? Uh, usually, androgen deprivation treatment is uh, to be started along at least uh, uh, prior to uh, the radiotherapy and is so to be continued for a uh, six months of uh, duration. If it's intermediate risk and if it's a high risk, then probably the ADT has to be extended to a period of up to three years. Okay. And What this is backed up by the Bola et al. ESRT study. Yeah. URTC study. Yeah. URTC study. Good. Uh, the disease free survival is seventy four percent versus forty percent. Overall survival is seventy eight percent versus sixty two percent. So there is a definite role for androgen deprivation treatment. Take me through the brachytherapy. Uh, brachytherapy it's a it's a localized form of uh, radiotherapy where the radiation is uh, given through pellets or a uh, radiation uh, <coughs> pellets which are placed into the prostate there are two types of brachytherapy one is uh, low dose radiation brachytherapy and there is a high dose uh, hdr brachytherapy uh, the hdr brachytherapy or the low dose brachytherapy involves a uh, implantation of permanent seeds of iodine 125 or uh, palladium 103 where the radiation to the prostate is a slow and a prolonged process and uh, the there is some radiation protection to be uh, followed such as uh, avoidance of exposure to pregnant women or children for initial few months and the patient should be to wear a condom during every intercourse in order to uh, uh, avoid an accidental uh, passing out of the pellet this is a low dose uh, radiation but it's a high dose radiation therapy or a high hdr brachytherapy involves uh, uh, plas- uh, plastic tubes into the prostate through which uh, uh, iodine 192 uh, seeds are placed for a short while and reward so the entire dose of radiation is given in a short time to the uh, prostate the side effects are uh, acute but uh, usually last only for a shorter period and uh, there is no need for any uh, radiological prevention or radiological protection after after the procedure Okay, your patient uh, completes the external beam radiotherapy. How will you arrange the follow-up? So uh, the follow-up will be uh, first review the patient in uh, three months time to look for any uh, early complications or any uh, difficulties and uh, any onset of uh, erectile dysfunction or any incontinence in the patient. I'll let you get a PSA done. 
and uh, the PSA is normal. Then they get the PSA done in the six month and uh, every six months for the next two years, and then uh, PSA as a yearly follow. What is the importance you need to consider when you are doing early PSA after EBRT? What may happen? Uh, there might be a transient rise in PSA. It's called a PSA bounce. It's usually a benign rise, usually occurring around uh, nine months to two years post radiotherapy. It can be it can occur after uh, external beam radiotherapy or as well as a brachytherapy. It's a benign rise, and the rise is usually not exceeding one point five nanogram per deciliter. Amen. Okay. Uh, say, for example, if a patient had radical surgery, is there any group of patients you will give something like an adjuvant radiotherapy post radical prostatectomy? Yeah, actually, there is a, a study called the radical study which stated that there is a no survival advantage of giving immediate post op radiotherapy to a radical prostatectomy patient, even if there is a margin positive. So, uh, the only radiotherapy indication a post uh, prostatectomy patient would be as a salvage radiotherapy if there is a clinical progression of the disease. Okay. What is the role for PSMA PET in the follow up? Uh, when there is a normal rise in a PSA, the PSMA PET scan is uh, tend to uh, uh, differentiate between whether it's a local recurrence or a metastatic uh, uh, source of the PSA. It helps in identifying the source but then differentiate it from the local recurrence or uh, from metastasis. So what should be the minimal PSA result before you can order PSMA PET scan for a post-radical prostatectomy patient? Uh, biochemical recurrence is uh, 0.2 nanogram per ml, so, but I'm not sure of the cutoff for PSMA PET CT. Yeah, it's the same thing. As long as it's uh, more than 0.2 nanogram per ml, then if you think that it, the uh, influence of PSMA, like the finding of a positive spot will influence the treatment, patient is quite young and fit, then there is a role for PSMA PET. Okay, good. What is your uh, thoughts on the hormone treatment? So let's, uh, uh, the patient going for radical radiotherapy, you are starting the hormones and then referring the patient to your oncology colleagues. How will you explain this hormone prescription to the patient? Uh, hormone treatment also called as uh, androgen uh, deprivation therapy. So the mechanism uh, of action behind it is uh, it uh, cuts off the androgen production in the body and uh, androgen or the testosterone is the uh, basic hormone which causes a pro proliferation of the prostatic acid cells. So by cutting off the androgen, the prostate cancer cells are uh, theoretically uh, cut off from its uh, induction uh, inducing hormones and uh, that way prevents the growth or progress of the carcinoma of the prostate. So this hormonal uh, depression can be either in the form of a surgery or a medical treatment. Surgery involves a bilateral orchiectomy or a castration, or as a medical forms involves a various uh, group of medicines such as anti-androgens, uh, LHRH uh, agonists, antagonists. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So, what is your usual prescription uh, given to the patient if you want to start neoadjuvant hormones for a patient heading towards radical radiotherapy? Uh, I'll give the option of a, a surgical castration or a anti androgen in the form of bicaltamine 150 milligram. So, Body. for a patient who is going for radical radiotherapy, you are starting okay. neoadjuvant hormones. Uh, why do you want to do bilateral orchiectomy? That will give a lifelong um, impact on the patient's quality of life, isn't it? It's only a neoadjuvant yeah, uh, treatment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay, so what is your choice? So, uh, I like to give uh, anti androgen bicalcomy. Okay. 150 milligram. Okay, so for a patient who is heading towards radical radiotherapy, especially for the okay. intermediate group of patients where you said you will give at least for six months of antigen deprivation treatment post radiotherapy along with neoadjuvant. And for high risk patients, you can give the hormones for up to three years, which is perfect. Okay. So you need to uh, start the patient on the commonest one in luteinizing hormone, releasing hormone antagonist, the commonest one, okay? 
and uh, i mean the commonest one is agonist commonest one is agonist so when you are giving agonist you will give some antiandrogens to avoid the flare up phenomenon what is the commonest agonist you use in your practice uh, it will be a gozeralin or busaril okay and why you need to give antiandrogens for when you are prescribing agonist and how long you will give antiandrogens Uh, so the LH and H agonist actually uh, causes by uh, actually functions by uh, causing up the downregulation of the receptors. But the initial period of around uh, two to four weeks, there will be a upregulation of upregulation of the androgen receptors, resulting in a, a flare-up phenomena, which causes a increased side effect profile such as a, a bone pain, uh, can even cause a retention, cardiovascular uh, disease or death, or even a clot compression. So in order to avoid this. Uh, Uh, anti-androgens has to be initiated at least one week prior to initiation of LHRH agonist, and to be continued for at least two to four weeks after the initiation of LHRH agonist. Why the cardiovascular death happens with flare-up? Uh, sorry, I'm not sure. Yeah, LHRH agonist uh, can cause hypercoagulable state. So because of the okay. hypercoagulation, it will result in utilizing the all the clotting mechanisms, so which can result in reactive bleeding. So the whole coagulation profile and uh, circulation is getting deranged. Okay. 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 How will you explain this androgen deprivation treatment to the patient? What is the usual side effect? What you will ask the patient to do? So uh, I'll uh, let the patient know that uh, we are cutting off the entire function of the androgens. So there will be side effects such as uh, 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 flushing, uh, nausea, vomiting, or headache, and uh, loss of libido. You can have a uh, gynecomastia, which can be either uh, painful or painless, and uh, uh, there will be erectile dysfunction. Yeah, the other things uh, you can, can also is... have certain mood and uh, cognition changes also, which can be very significant and troublesome. Yeah. So the other thing is metabolic syndrome. So patient may gain weight, especially in the mid segment. So they need to keep an eye on the weight and uh, do the routine activities yeah. on the bone resorption or the postural process. Yeah. Good. Yeah. What do you know about LHRH uh, antagonist? Uh, LHRH antagonist is uh, dexamethasone. Okay. Uh, and uh, the most common dose. So, Degarlix is given in the dose of like two hundred and fifty milligrams as the first dose, followed by monthly eighty milligrams. Um, and the, the the disadvantage with Degarlix is the injection site they can get quite hyper reactive uh, allergic reactions, and it's also quite costly. So, Degarlix is specifically reserved for patients who have possible like uh, spinal cord impinging compression or something which can cause a derangement with LHRH antagonist so those patients are like extensive metastasis where you feel that even though you can give anti androgens the flare up may happen in the background so those patients you can give LHRH agonist uh, as you said the dose is important and uh, sure. also it's quite difficult to give in community in uk practice but of course that is not very important for your exam point of view good now we are going for the last scenario you are on call you are presented with a patient with urinary retention the a and e doctors catheterized him and the patient is now stable when the doctors catheterized and did a dre they found that uh, patient's prostate is quite craggy so they asked you to review when you reviewed the patient he is a 72 year old gentleman otherwise quite healthy on a single drug for his well controlled diabetes his retention is due to a pint of beer he had during the christmas eve and uh, the catheter is in place clear urine draining dre showed quite hard firm prostate at least t3 if not t4 and what will you do uh, so i like to exam this patient uh, uh, get a history out of him and i mean assess a history and examine his spine then so i like to ask for a, a psa test in this patient okay his psa is uh, 507 okay, so uh, the patient has a uh, very hard prostate probably a t3 or t4 with a very high psa and uh, a history of aur so uh, uh, the most probably it could be a metastatic uh, carcinoma of the prostate with the uh, position of the metastasis in the spinal cord probably in the uh, spine probably causing a cord compression which could have resulted in the acute urinary retention so i like to get a urgent mri uh, done 
to assess uh, assess the spine of this patient for any cord compression before heading to the urgent mri etc you should examine the patient for any neurological deficit and uh, abdominal examination and if the patient okay. is neurologically intact the chances of spinal cord is less nothing wrong in doing it and you can play this around by other methods also say for example now you know this patient has got prostate cancer obviously what kind of staging you will do staging scans mm -hmm. what what is your choice for staging in this patient Uh, I did a CT scan of uh, thorax, abdomen, and the pelvis. Yeah, the so staging scan comprises of lymph node staging, bone metastatic staging, and systemic metastasis. Systemic metastasis, like brain metastasis, etc., is quite extremely rare with prostate cancer. We don't have to do like MRI of brain or anything for the metastatic cancer patient routinely, unless if they have symptomatically got some possible neurological findings. So, in general, the staging is. CT of thorax, abdomen, and pelvis, which is fine. Thorax is left out for early stage patients, but your patient is in PSA in the region of 500s, so it's always better to do a thorax, abdomen, and pelvis and a bone scan. So bone scan is a very good investigation, which will tell you about how far the spine is involved, and uh, even CT also give you some idea. So that bone scan with CT will help you whether you need another specialized MRI scan to look for spinal cord impingement, etc. The patient has no focal neurological symptoms. If the bone scan shows the distribution of metastasis is acceptable, and then you can hold on with MRI of spine. MRI of spine. the yes the patient present with retention so you are thinking process of whether the spinal cord compression is the reason for the retention is the correct one but make sure you do the complete staging also okay okay sure sure, sure. your patient had staging which showed quite extensive lymph node metastasis in the retroperitoneum prostate also obviously quite heterogeneous in the ct scan which shows possible prostate cancer as you know from dre onwards the bone scan did not show any significant spinal cord mets but there is a good amount of sclerotic metastasis in the left hip and uh, left shoulder which is quite characteristic for prostate cancer so what will you proceed further how will you proceed further so this patient is having a metastatic carcinoma of the prostate mm -hmm. So uh, I like to start him on a, a AT with the chemotherapy, AT and uh, docetaxel. Since it's a uh, docetaxel name, so I like to start him on AT on uh, docetaxel. What you need before you starting chemotherapy? Any other important thing you need? I need to get a, a complete uh, renal function test and a uh, liver function test on the patient. good so in spite of that let us assume the renal function and liver function tests were normal in spite of that the oncologist is not happy to start on docetaxel what important parameters they will be expecting for you to arrange so you need to arrange a biopsy because uh, for chemotherapy diagnostic uh, yeah for a chemotherapy it's a quite a very very costly business so the oncologist uh, even though we all know that definitely patient has metastatic prostate cancer they need some tissues so that on the paper we are correct in giving chemotherapy to the correct patient we are not giving anything wrongly so at least you don't need a transrectal ultrasound guided you don't need a transperineal um, local anesthesia guided all you need is just a bedside finger guided biopsies maybe two from each side or one from each side just to prove the histology the histology shows gleason score 5 plus 5 involving all the four cores so as you mentioned we are starting him on antigen deprivation treatment with docetaxel you will be starting antigen deprivation treatment and when you refer to the oncologist they will start on docetaxel any okay. evidence you have to support docetaxel sorry i'm not clear yeah charted and stampede or the two studies yes. yeah whether you yeah. remember charted or not you should present stampede because it's one of the very iconic uk based study and uh, Do you know how docetaxel works? Uh, it's uh, works by causing a uh, microtubular disorder. It disturbs the microtubule formation in the brain. Okay. Any dose you are aware of? Uh, doses given as uh, six doses. Each uh, dose uh, given three weeks apart. It's a IV dose of seventy-five uh, milligram per square meter. Okay. Good. So, 
What do you mean by castrate resistant prostate cancer? Uh, it's a biochemical or a, a radiological uh, progression of the disease, even when the serum testosterone level is at or below the castrate level of 15 nanogram. Okay. So if it happens, what is your choice? For castrate resistant prostate uh, cancer, what are all the agents so the, you have? Uh, the treatment choices, if the patient has been uh, docetaxel named, then uh, you can give a uh, docetaxel to the patient. Or if the patient has already been treated with docetaxel, then uh, you can go for uh, either abiraterone with uh, prednisolone combination or uh, enzaltamide or uh, even capacitaxel. Why do you need to give prednisolone when you are giving abiraterone? Uh, abiraterone can uh, cause a... Uh, uh, Decrease, uh, disturbance of the adrenal metabolism resulting in a uh, hypoaldosteronism, so uh, it is supplementary with the uh, pregnancy. Okay, now we go to a slightly parallel scenario and uh, almost a similar patient but uh, presenting with uh, weakness in the lower limb. So, as you previously expected, we are suspecting metastatic cord compression. So, what difference it makes if you have the clinical signs of metastatic cord compression? in an emergency situation in AE. &E. If it's a <coughs> metastatic cord compression, then uh, urgent intervention has to be uh, directed towards it. So uh, we'll be starting him on a corticosteroid, a dexamethasone, a dose of uh, 60 milligram, um, and to be followed up with the dexamethasone until the cord compression or the neurological uh, uh, symptoms stabilizes. Yeah, uh, you can continue 16 milligram, 16 milligram per day, and uh, as long as the patient is going for any uh, bilateral orchiectomy or radiotherapy, then slowly you can reduce the dose. And parallelly, you can start yeah. the patient on um, GnRH antagonist yeah. also. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. And patient needs uh, analgesics for pain and bisphosphonates to make sure the bone health is maintained. And uh, you can discuss the patient, uh, the surgery or radiotherapy uh, as a palliative method or mostly this, in this group patients they will head towards like a conservative measure of uh, chemotherapy to control the disease because it will be an obvious bone metastatic patient. And uh, so make sure that uh, you are aware of patients uh, leg swelling or neurological deficit in the lower limb. Um, anorexia, weight loss, and bone tenderness, etc. It is an emergency situation. These scenarios may present even in the emergency table. And uh, metastatic cord compression, you should be much more confident. I don't want to take this further because I think you are talking for uh, more than now, almost 50 minutes now. So I think you need some rest. Uh, overall, I think you are quite good. I am very happy. I have no doubt in your progression or the result in the future. Uh, I'm happy with your small, small details of the data and uh, quoting the articles, etc. You are quite good in the basics of the PSA, early investigations, uh, low risk, intermediate risk, active surveillance, etc. But when we go slightly towards advanced scenarios like chemotherapy, you, you struggle a bit. I don't know whether it's just because of tiredness or you need to really beep up and uh, revise the content of the advanced uh, radiotherapy and uh, some data like for chemotherapy, charted trials, stampede trial, etc. I wish you to perform in the same high standards in the chemotherapy part of also because there are a lot of new things have happened and uh, you should be knowing about the immune checkpoint inhibitors for prostate cancer. A lot of new things have happened. I wish you to bring those things. And uh, otherwise, no concern. My, my only concern is, uh, as you may know, you may be revising our study material in the YouTube channel in the past. And uh, we are working to update those materials. And uh, I don't want you to just stick to our materials alone. So always keep a reference with uh, EAU 2022 guidelines. And uh, we try to update the material anyway. But uh, sometimes our material in YouTube is becoming like uh, uh, easy read and people are using it as a shortcut. But I don't want the people to use only that as a single solitary source. I wish people to think out of the box 
talks read from different resources and if you find a resource which is excellent but we are not incorporating in our youtube channel please just email me i'm quite happy to go through them so that uh, ultimately we wish the youtube channel to be a single excellent source for everything all the urological exam needs but we may be lacking here and there truthfully so i want people to learn out of the channel resource also uh, otherwise i'm quite happy i think uh, you have to just keep your mind calm maintain the same speed and uh, at one point you asked me again the histology details so as i said always keep a paper and pen and make a note of all the psa values histology values so never ask a patient or i mean uh, never ask an examiner whatever he already told you unless if you are in quite doubt or if the examiner words are not clear to you try to make a note of it that's a very good habit in all the tables any questions you have before we conclude today's session Uh, nothing I can think of right now. Good. I think yeah, I'm sure you will be quite mentally tired. Any topic you want to discuss for the next class, or you can uh, even you... message in the WhatsApp. Uh, uh, yeah. Hello, doctor. Hi, uh, Fahad. I think Fahad is here. We missed I, you. I, I didn't get uh, your message in time. No problem. Sorry no problem. for the... that. Sorry. That's fine. Uh, 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 what topic you want to discuss next time? um we can uh, discuss the penile penile okay, cancer uh, okay penile uh, uh, tumor maybe yeah okay so we'll discuss penile tumor and uh, based upon my on call as i said i'm on call till thursday based upon the on call i will try to find a date and time uh, for how i will send today's recording in our whatsapp group so go through that if you have any questions in prostate cancer please feel free to uh, put a message we will discuss that okay Okay thank you thank you good have a nice uh, weekend guys uh, thank you